The Hog's Die is brought to you by TicketClub.com, your one-stop shop for live events nationwide. Whether you're looking for game, theater, or live performance tickets, don't sweat it. TicketClub.com has you covered. So make sure you're going there for all your live entertainment needs, and make sure you're clicking over to them from the banner at the top of the hogsdie.com. It's Just Business with Steve Thomas and John Wool. And now, here's your host, Chris Leary. Hello and welcome to another episode of It's Just Business on the Hogsty Network, a network that's growing, adding shows, and continuing its sports dominance in the podcasting realm. We are joined by its, uh, I don't know, CEO, Executive Director, Grand Poobah. Steve, how you doing? I'm doing all right, man. I don't know if I would call myself the CEO. Um, probably forced managing editor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe that's a maybe good title. The, yeah, <laughs> um, John, John is not here with us today, obviously, because John is in. Where did he say he was? Singapore, Singapore or somewhere. Yeah. So I don't know why he's using Singapore as an excuse to not be on the show. You know, seems to me he has clock. You know, can wake up in the middle of the night. But I guess we don't care. It matter to him apparently. He's he's competing in the global championships of the four. Night eSports Championship Series. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. Him and him and uh, Darius Geis. Yeah, right. <laughs> Playing on Rick Fox's sponsored team. Um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> which is amazingly a thing. I, I didn't know. Did Rick Fox? Rick Fox has a Fortnite team. It's not Fortnite. I think it's Overwatch or one of the other ones. But yeah, he he is the owner and manager of an eSports. At least one esports team, and who knows? Since I last checked that in on that, maybe he's expanded into other games or whatever. Wow, I didn't know that. I, it just seems I know John's into it, and it just seems the whole thing seems ridiculous to me. But that's just me being a fuddy duddy. <laughs> we'll hit on some of this later, and it's not nearly as nefarious. But he basically did it to be able to uh, bond and connect with his son, and now he's one of the great moguls of esports. And by that, we're talking about Rick, not John. Yes, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> John is not a mogul of esports. <laughs> Even though he tries. <laughs> yeah, I think he, if, if you gave John a lifelong dream, that might be it. All right, well, so we'll see how he does in the Singapore <laughs> International. Um, but no, we're going to get back to the realm of sports uh, that are played only with real people and only mildly fantastical. Uh, and we're going to jump right in with something that, you know what, quite frankly, feels like it might be from a video game um, and feels just as as goofy and unreal. And that is the new highest paid player in Major League Baseball, Mike Trout, with an eye popping contract. Give us the scope of the contract, Steve. <laughs> OK, it's just crazy. This is a 12-year, $426.5 million contract with the Angels, who he's played with since the beginning of his career. $20 million signing bonus, 100% guaranteed. Average annual salary of about $35.5 million. Um, there, here, the mind-boggling part is there are no opt-outs. Again, we talked about this with Bryce Harper last time, last show. No opt out. So the Angels are married to this guy through 2030. <laughs> 2030. Um, he's got some interesting, interesting uh, benefits in this thing. He's got a home game suite. He's got Diamond Club tickets that go along with it. But um, $426 million. Uh, you know, Bryce Harper was the highest paid player in Major League Baseball history for what? A week? 10 minutes? Yeah, 10 days maybe. Um, I, I mean, I guess if there's any one player in the entire league you would want to risk this kind of contract on it would be Mike Trout. You know, it, there's probably not a safer bet, but that's still a long contract for any player. Who knows what's going to happen to Mike Trout, you know? Yeah, he wouldn't, you know, baseball players can hit a wall for sure, so that's a long-time investment. It really will probably, I mean, a lot can happen, I guess, but it's going to, by the time he retires, and let's say, you know, he retires, uh, you know, with with uh, the A, not the A's, the uh, Angels. Angels. Um, you know, which is something can happen, but it's a safe bet with this contract. That's going to be a pretty big anomaly in pro sports to someone who, 
started and ends that long a career with one team. There's not going to be many dudes like that by the end of it. You know, even Bryce Harper that, you know, may is still two teams over the is probably the course of his career. I mean, the the the, the two I can think of are off the top of my head are Dirk Nowitzki and Kobe Bryant in, in basketball. Um so those two, I mean, if you wanted to speculate as others in baseball, Clayton Kershaw maybe you know, he's been with the Dodgers this entire time and he's an all time great and you know, the Dodgers probably won't let him go. Uh so that would be another one. But really and truly the only ones I can think of are Dirk and Kobe in the, and that's in in um the NBA. The only one I'd add, and the story's not completely written yet, is you know Alex Ovechkin probably retires as a capital and signed a similar you know, the scale and the economies are different in the different pro sports, but signed a ten year lockdown deal now is like seven years ago but that so and he probably would be able to play at the end of that contract so that that may not even play out either but that's the other one that pops to mind as potential yeah. i mean it's just the, the rules in the nfl are such that this is just never going to happen in the nfl basically you know if peyton manning and joe montana didn't make it you know basically nobody's going to make that make it this long um you know but just to put mike trout's contract in perspective um, we have not entered the decade yet in which the contract terminates. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, the contract terminates in 2030, and it is now 2019. He's going to be 38 years old. <clears throat> so the Angels really and truly did lock him down for the rest of his career. Now, here's the here's what I want to ask you, though. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I don't know how happy Major League Baseball is about this. I'm not talking about the money. I mean, I'm sure the players union is probably thrilled with those with the contract, but Trout has locked himself into what is from a visibility standpoint uh the minor league team in Los Angeles, and it is certainly not one of the high-profile teams in Major League Baseball or even in or even in the American League. Um Trout has always been a guy to me who's been as far off the radar as possible for a guy who is the best player in baseball. So I don't know if if I was Major League Baseball, um, I don't know how happy I'd be with him being married to the Angels, which is basically an invisible team, and rather than letting like the Red Sox or the Yankees or the Dodgers or the Cubs or somebody buy him out. Yeah, I mean, it's still Los Angeles or still Southern California. So, you know, it's not, at least you're not in kind of a geographic desert, as they say. Um, but I totally agree with you. And also, from the Angels' perspective, what have they won with Mike Trout so far? Nothing. I mean, Mike Trout's Zero. been in the league, what, seven, eight years already? Something in that neighborhood? I don't know six? if it's eight years. Yeah, best six. Let's enough, call it six. Enough time. And he was basically a fiend. You know, he didn't, he was pretty much a phenom as soon as he started playing major league baseball so um you know they haven't won anything with him so this is a you know this i don't think you know here's what i'll say about these these long-term contracts you know the countdown clock has now begun to one of these guys whining and belly aching about how they get out of it probably bryce harper um but um you know so the right now for me the countdown clock is started on when we've got a daily sports story about how let's just call him Bryce Harper has to get out from underneath this lockdown contract. <laughs> yeah, well, and first of all, Harper entered the league in 2011, so he's about to enter his ninth season to answer that question. Um, I think this deal, I, I think Harper or not Harper, I think um, the Trout contract has less of a possibility of going Kafui than Harper's, you know, because Harper's a much more mercurial personality. You know, and, and and Mike Trout's a better baseball player than Bryce Harper is. You know, quite frankly, I mean, what what's really going to go south is, is if Trout starts having injuries. You know, if we do that, if he gets to like, you know, age thirty-two, and now he's got shoulder problems or you know knee problems or whatever else, and and it becomes um, a really highly paid, not as productive player, that's when it's going to go south. Like Bryce Harper, I, you like I agree with you last last week. Harper's contract's going to be. They're going to regret that in five minutes, you know. But Trout, I think, and, and he's much less of a mercurial personality, as I said. So he's not going to complain. And I think part of the reason why he's been kind of invisible in terms of baseball superstars, just the nature of his personality, he's not really a spotlight guy is the other thing. So he could maybe be in New York and be somewhat under the radar even there. And you know? uh, Southern California is a much easier place to live than Philadelphia and Southern California is a much 
better place to be a high profile athlete, both from positive and negatives than Philadelphia. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, we all I make fun of Philadelphia all the time and half of the reason is just so I can irritate John who likes the city of Philadelphia, but um yeah, I, I mean the media in LA is nothing like the media glare in New York and it's nothing like the fan glare in Philadelphia because the fans in Philadelphia are brutal and awful and ugly and that's just not going to happen in LA at all. I mean, they're going to, you know, if Mike Trout goes into the slump, they're going to barely notice. <laughs> you know. Right. The media about won't the Dodgers. Yeah, and maybe, you know, and they may be talking about movies or something else, you know. Like, we all, did you see the little film clip of the Rams in the NFC Championship game in that sports bar? Oh, yeah, did like you see the this? Bear, yeah, I saw that. And they were, they like kind of shrugged and went, oh, is it over? Yeah, okay, well, that's cool. <laughs> you know, I mean, that that's the attitude, especially in Anaheim. And because no matter what the Angels call themselves, that's what they are. You know, they're really the Anaheim you know, kind of on the outskirts on the southern part. They're not L.A.'s team. They're really Anaheim's team. And that's even more um, detached, you know, shall we say, than even L.A. is. Because the Dodgers fan base is a lot of regular people. You know, a lot of like the middle to lower income folks are Dodgers fans. That's not what L.A. You know, the Angels are. You know, so they're truly even less detached. And so I think if Mike Trout goes into a slump, it may truly be a, just a, eh, you know, that's about it, a meh kind of response to him. So I, if you're going to sign a contract like this from a player's perspective, you know, maybe that's the way to go. You know, where one where you know you're not going to get criticized. And I know in a world that someone got $300 million, we shouldn't be calling them having a, a bad couple months. But in the context, you know, this is just the kind of exclamation point egg on the face to – to Harper and and Scott Boris here at the end of this uh, off season run because you know they they played games they probably lost out in the end on a better situation and you know they staked their claim to this great greatest be- biggest contract in baseball that really like was a blip on the radar until it was obliterated. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, and again, I think um, you know. I don't know either of these guys and won't ever know either of these guys, but Harper seems to be a much more of an ego guy. I mean, I'm sure Mike Trout has an ego because all people in his position do, but I, I, you know, this came out of nowhere. The the other thing I guess we haven't mentioned is that Mike Trout was not a free agent. Right. Yeah. This, he, this was not needed yet. Yeah. He's a free agent next year or was. Um, and so this is just, and this came up completely out of nowhere. There was no report that they were talking. There was no nothing. It was just announced, you know. And so this is, I think, shows the way Artie Moreno, who owns Angels, and Mike Trout uh, operate. You know, they they didn't want this put in the spotlight. They did. Mike Trout's agent is not Scott Boris, who's a way out there in front, who's kind of a minor celebrity in his own right. Um, it's really and truly sort of the opposite way. It's opposite of of Bryce Harper's contract in every way possible i think so i give this more of if you want to give me odds uh, you know i'll put the over and under this one going kaflui at i don't know the seven year point yeah because that's he's going to be uh mid 33 at that point so i'll give it that long until people start regretting it and if he had if there's a world series in there or maybe even a couple like deep postseason runs when he hits the wall, there may be enough fan capital and even team capital where, you know, they'll they they'll eat it, right? It won't be like this big issue. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, and, and the only thing um that that they may be forced to regret this for is this. <laughs> um you know, there's the new kind of pseudo salary cap in baseball, which is the luxury tax threshold. Now, the Angels are a team that has a really good farm system. They've got a lot of young players coming up. And so part of the reason why they can do this and not, you know, owe so much money as for a repeater tax is they've got so many young players. So if you get to later in the contract when some of those young players have gotten through arbitration, the arbitration period and they're going to be owed contracts um that's when the team becomes really expensive unless you just kind of flush those guys out of the system and start over in which case the team probably won't be good again you know so that's why i think sort of the middle of this contract is when it's going to be sort of questionable yeah and if it's if it's mike trout his contract and a bunch of nobodies you know battling to be mediocre that'll be the worst case scenario 
Yeah, exactly. All right, we're going to move on uh, from baseball, which is just warming up and uh, currently in spring training mode, to the hot white part of the NCAA men's basketball season, which, of course, is March Madness, the NCAA tournament, which I think is just finished up or maybe finishing up today, which is Saturday. It's first round. We're heading into the round two of the games. Go Maryland. Um, but when the sport is in this biggest spotlight and we're coming off the the blown shoe heard round the world with Zion Williamson back uh, during the regular season, um, you know, the, the question of the, the equity for the players, paying players, this is obviously where the NCAA is just cha-chinging the cash register with Marsh Madness on every way possible, TV deals, you know, any way that the NCAA and the schools can make money right now, they are. Um, so the question of... You know, are the players fairly co- compensated? Is this just really a minor league? The equity in college sports, not only for men's basketball, but then what implications that has to the whole university athletic system come into play? And there's been an interesting idea. Uh, I like to kind of think of it as a middle path has started to emerge around, y- no, we can't pay them. Yes, there could be some kind of fiscal um protections in the system, um, which has come up with an athlete insurance idea. Steve, what are the details? Well, yeah, first of all, we're, uh, Chris, you've seen this in other places where I saw this first posed was a Twitter account called, uh, oh God, what did I say it was? Sports Law Talk. So that's where I saw this first. Um, so the detail, the idea here is is a loss of earnings insurance proposal. And what that means is um, you know, that the insured event would be if, say, Zion Williamson gets hurt, he's unable to play baseball or basketball, rather, then the insurance policy would kick in. And so the thought is, in lieu of paying the players, should the NCAA provide this type of insurance to every one of its athletes? So in other words, if even if someone on, you know, the volleyball team, which nobody's watching and nobody's paying for, gets hurt in such a manner that prevents the player from earning a living down the road, then the insurance policy kicks in. Um, I get it, but to me, I think you have the same problem as you have with paying players it's a benefit paid by the university and you know the premiums for such policy for zion williamson are going to be different than the volleyball player unless everybody gets the same amount of the insurance in which case it's not going to really matter for a guy like zion if the only way i think to make it work under title line would be to have everybody get the same policy and that means a very low that means a very very low um you know, in, insurance value, uh, you know, because otherwise, you know, nobody's going to show the volleyball player for millions, you know. So it, I think that's the only way you could make it legally work. And it's an interesting thought. But I mean, the, the other part of this is why would the NCAA do it? You know, why would the NCAA do this? What are they getting out of it? I'm not saying from a moral perspective they shouldn't, I'm saying from a callous business reason. Why would the NCAA want to provide this? You know, they don't have an obligation to it, and they're getting nothing out of it. And if there's anything we know about the NCAA, is they're all about money first. Uh, there's, thing, there's a lot to like about this idea. It's one of those things that on surface has a kind of common sense ring to it, right? Um, and I think, you know, I said in the last show, you know, maybe the status quo just holds because, and I still think you know, that could very much be the case. But it does feel like, we're getting close to some kind of reckoning here at some point. Now, I totally agree with you. The first thing, and you've conditioned me on this, uh, that I thought was that, you know, that sounds great, but it it doesn't actually, it doesn't skirt the essential issue, which is the Title IX and the equity and all of those pieces, right? It just is a, you know, it still runs into that ro- that same roadblock if you, you know, as paying them. So to me, like, you don't necessarily get around that boulder, um, however, you know, they're going to figure, they're going to have to figure something out. At least I hope they're going to figure something out. And, you know, you'd figure this, you know, we've solved many bigger problems in the world than, than this. You'd think you'd be a way to figure it out. And I think you said it maybe one of the last times we talked about it, I can't remember exactly which show, but at some point you're probably, the only way to handle this to some degree is at some point slicing off 
men's basketball and men's football as separate entities, whether they're pseudo public private, whether they're pseudo professional, whether they're licensed brands, you know, like there's going to have to be some, because ultimately if you're trying to untangle, which is there for majority good reasons, by the way, at least from my point of view, the, the equity rules within college athletics, it's much easier to slice off men's basketball and football and and treat them differently, but and and figure out how to deal with the other ninety five percent of college athletics on on university campuses. Yeah, well, first of all, they already are a licensed brand. Okay, I mean, anytime if you can buy a University of Texas football jersey, it's a licensed brand, <laughs> and so it's not really so much that it needs to be a licensed brand. It's that the entities. The, the operation of the football and basketball programs probably need to be divorced from the university system. Well, that's entirely. what I, that's sort of more what I mean. And then some fiscal transaction bring that allows the team to use, you know, uh, Texas or whatever. It's almost like yeah. a reverse licensing. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, just my attorney mind is going, okay, licensing, you know, they're already licensing, you know, there's already trademarks. <laughs> um, but, you know, I... Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. See, I, I think these kids have to be allowed to be students if they want to be, you know, because it, it, there's many, many people who use athletic scholarships as a means, to, including football and basketball players, as a means to get an education. You know, it's that the Zion Williamson isn't, and, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know, you know, the wide receiver at Alabama may not be doing it, but 90% of the people, who, you know, everybody at, like the University of Delaware, you know, is, is using it to go to school. You know, they may not to say they may not have NFL dreams, but by and large, if you're going to, you know, the vast majority of football and basketball programs, you know, you're not going to be in the NFL and the NBA. And, you know, first of all, your future earnings value is not going to be what Kyler Murray's future earnings value is, for example. You know, you know that. Um, so I think, yes, I, I think that eventually the way to do it is to somehow slice football and basketball off. But at the same time, you know, I think you have to, I, I mean, this may be running contrary to what I've said before, but there has to be a means to allow these kids to continue to use athletics to go to school if they want to. So somehow there needs to be a middle ground where it's a pro system, but they can, simultaneously you beat students so you have like a longhorn football team that's affiliated with texas and the students can be students if they want but if they don't want to they don't uh, you know i don't know but there, you can't just take away every football and basketball scholarship and say you know you guys aren't you guys are no longer students that's also not a good not good for society you know? no and i've seen some good some other people that i've seen kevin sheehan actually on his Actually, very good podcast. After he was bounced from 980 in DC, um, you know, he had some. He he sort of had an interesting plan that kind of bundled a bunch of these middle ground solutions and pulled it forward. And one of them was actually deferred admission. So, oh, okay, you know, so the player, it, it all of these things have a whole like you know cat's cradle of downfield issues. So that's that's a given. But um, but basically. You know, you know. Let's say you go for. Let's say you're a one and done in college basketball. Uh, you know, once you declared for the NBA and you're drafted by the Milwaukee Bucks, lucky you. You know that you don't. That you don't. That and then that's when your scholarship ends, right? From a from an academic perspective. So if you get some kind of def, you know deferment. So let's say you crash and burn, or you do a five year NBA run, or you know whatever, or you maybe even have a good year, you know, but you're still thirty three and need you know you, that you would your admission to the university is all can always be activated. So you can always return when that makes more sense for you as an individual. Yeah, you know, like. For the stars, the, the university is going to do that anyway. Like Shaquille O'Neal went back to LSU and got his degree from LSU, for example, because he, he left early and he went back years later. And there are many players out there who in their off seasons, will, especially football, which has a longer off offseason, um, will go back to the university and take classes in the off season. But, um, you know, I don't know if there's the same admissions practices for the non-stars as the Shaquille O'Neal's of the world. And it would, have, it would have to go hand in glove with some way in which, okay, so during fall for college football, 
there aren't like class requirements, right? Like I'd also have to figure out those pieces as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and it was, it was, his ideas was coupled with some kind of insurance, raising the stipend, loosening the sort of like BS rules around like if an assistant coach buys a cheeseburger for a player, they're in violation. So it was a kind of, it was a bouquet of these kind of, you know, mini fixes. Well, you know, and that, those rules are just dumber than all possible comprehension you know the cheeseburger rules um you know the, the way you could do to get back to the original question the way you could do the insurance is you know, the ncaa could have some sort of mass group policy written by you know whoever maybe a number of underwriters in which they're providing every student with say you know i'll make a number up a hundred thousand dollar premium in the event that they suffer an injury that is career threat career threatening or or threatens that some objective threshold threatens their ability to work as a result of their injuries you know and that's going to be the people who suffer those are going to be very 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 slim you know truly because you could also you want to be cynical about it you could say if you know the the quarterback at michigan you know suffers that kind of injury and can't play football well you know Odds are, unless he's a vegetable, he can still go work and earn a living. So then, is the insurance policy really pay out? You know, that's the only way you could get it and not have a Title IX problem is to have some sort of baseline, same policy for everybody. Um, but if you get away with that and provide Kyler Murray, you know, with the policy that is equivalent to his worth, that's when you have the problem. So it's um, it, 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 the reason why this problem has not been fixed is that there is not an easy solution to it. No, not at it's all. It's a very, very complicated problem, and um, it's probably going to require congressional in- involvement, and Congress can't even pass a budget, much less solve a problem. <laughs> you know, so they're going to be no help whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing that just would be so, but the, the basketball specific that I think was needs to get changed immediately is let the players enter the NBA. This like the legislation of the one and done is what, you know, like gets this, gets these one and done issues. You know, this what now Zion Williamson still might have gone to Duke, but you know, but if he had had the option to go right to the NBA or in fact went right to the NBA, you kind of hurdle this, you know, cause we really, at some point we're trying to solve a problem for the elite. Right. This is that's actually why this is hard to solve, because the other, you know, and by non elite, you might be talking about still very high level college athletes, starters. even in football and basketball. Star- yes. Starters. Yeah, yeah. Not let alone the, you know, the crew team. So um, so that's actually the problem. So actually, if you just said, OK, if you think you're good enough, like, why are we creating barriers, you know, legislating barriers for players, not especially in basketball, not to be able to jump. And so if you're the next Kwame Brown, buddy, that's on you, not the system. Yeah. But you see, we're not creating a barrier. The NBA yeah. has has a rule in place, and I don't really mind that the NBA has a rule in place. To me, it's a they're a private entity, you know, it's a private association, uh, you made up of a bunch of private companies. So if they want to have a rule that says you have to be one year away from high school, I don't have a problem with it. I don't care, you know, what they what their rules. I don't care. Um, that's their business. It'd be one thing if the government was uh, was legislating that that I would have a problem with. But if the NBA wants to do that for whatever reason, maybe they think these guys can't handle the money at eighteen and you know one year of growth. You know, maybe it's better. I mean, we all know that the real reason is they just you know they want the NCAA basketball to serve as their farm team. You know, their farm system. Um, that's really what it is. But I also don't have a problem with that either. You know, I mean, I feel bad for the kids, sure. If, you know, Zion Williamson wanted to go directly in the NBA and make money ahead of time, you know, great. I mean, I would get it. But I'm not going to bash the NBA, a private company, a private entity, for passing a rule about an internal rule about who they're going to hire. I don't think that's any of my business whatsoever to dictate that to them. Yeah, no, I don't, I'm not questioning their autonomy to make their own rules. I think it's a, but I, I will say, I think, you think it's, it's a, a short sided rule. rule. Yeah. 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 Well, that's fair enough. Um, all right, so we're going to move on because we got a lot of rat tat tat topics today. Um, the next one, sort of, you know, one that skips around the national headlines, the sort of gossip paper headlines, and does have some sports implications as this, uh, I don't know, we'll call it the 1% college admission rider uh, story. You probably followed it. You know, they've got a couple of 
Hollywood celebrities, so that that makes it a little bit splashy, but basically very, you know, upper echelon wealth, using all kinds of money and means to uh, get their spawn into top universities. Who knew that USC was a top university? I guess that's one thing we learned through this. Um, you know, like if you're gonna if you're gonna spend half a million dollars, make it Stanford, but you know, who am I to judge? Um <laughs> uh, but uh but you just proved you're from the east coast <laughs> yeah probably um hey at least i didn't say harvard um <laughs> so and this has touched the sports especially college athletic world because a whole ecosystem of high school and college coaches are actually part of a really what is a spider web of connections to get these kids in and so the ucla soccer coach uh, men's soccer coach, right? It gets a little confusing, but just had to step down because he was taking bribes. Um, well, we're, we're here about one. There's probably others, but he, he took about a hundred thousand dollar bribe, um, to basically create a ghost player in a daughter of a big developer who was trying to get into the university. Um, and so he basically faked that she was a soccer player when she was not for a good amount of money. And because the scandal hit, he is now had to resign so what does this what does this say to you steve about how deep the system goes in this sort of like mid to lower tier college athletics yeah um first of all for those of you who don't know because we're a dc centric place usc is one of the elite private universities in california it's it's got some it's sort of the second tier down in nationally in admission standards it's not stanford harvard service academies but it's the very next tier down in terms of admissions it's very hard to get into USC's and this is why like Lori Laughlin's kids couldn't get in you know it's not like you know I don't know Iowa State it's it's a it's it is in fact sort of a half step down from Stanford in terms of how hard it is to get in um but um yeah first of all the story we're reading here is uh I just oh I just closed my window <laughs> nuts um I'll talk oh here it is okay this is uh Fox News um and this is dated i don't see a date it, it's dated the 23rd of march ucla soccer touch steps down amid column mission bribery scandal so that's the story um i first of all my what first of all ran through my head is why is a men's soccer coach recruiting a female player but maybe that's not that unusual you know as you brought up off air chris when you're talking about a sort of smaller sport i guess um I have so many thoughts about these things. It's number one, you're kind of doing the kid a disservice. The, I'm talking about the parents. If you get a kid admitted to a university for which he or she is not qualified, you know, it, 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 and you're automatically putting them at a disadvantage. You know, do they have the chops to get through a school like that academically? You know, and it's really and truly in some part, it's about your own ego and not about the kid. You know, there's all. You know, there's all sorts of issues like that. But in terms of the school, schools that are involved, UCLA and USC most particularly, um, you know, color me shocked to say that there's corruption going on in university athletics. I mean, I am stunned, truly stunned that there's yet more money and more bribery. It's funny that this time the coaches are being the ones bri being bribed and not doing the bribing. You know, as as like Rick Patino, you know, would would note it's you know, we've talked a lot about money being going from basketball coaches to players. And I think it's kind of ironic now that the players are paying the coaches, you know, here. Um, look, it's a crime. You know, there there's indictments that are, you know, out here about this. It's, you know, the legal issues are complicated. Um, I think it's kind of sad because these parents are inadvertently ruining their kids lives by trying with a misguided effort to help them the misguided part being probably for the parents own ego more so than even for their kids that what's even yeah i mean that you said a mouthful there i mean it's so first of all like the fact that the, the, and I'm sorry, I don't have his name, but the, the mastermind of this, you know, the kingpin of this whole scandal, the, you know, the hub was really genius. It's, William, William, it's Rick Singer is his name. Right. And that's right. Rick Singer. And, you know, let's just take a sec, you know, 
put take your moral hat off for a second and put it on the your seat beside you. You have to admire the the depth of this guy's scheme. I mean, and the knowing that what a soft underbelly this like large tail world of college athletic was to you know to find the right people to bribe to write, write, write palms to Greece to you know the right where you could actually hide player names on you know ghost accounts basically within these athletic systems it's just remarkable so i have a certain amount of admiration just <laughs> just from his planning you're uh, admiring the criminal element because of the brilliance of the crime yes uh i am actually <laughs> um and but one thing that really jumps out to me is that you know we talked we've said usc and ucla here it was actually a mistake it was actually the, the father of this ghost soccer player wanted his daughter to go to USC, but they accidentally messed that up and put that through general application so that they had to scramble to get into UCLA, which then is what got this soccer coach, you know, then they had to buy that seat. So it's just kind of funny that this was even kind of a mistake um, that, it, that we're talking <laughs> UCLA rather than USC, as that was the number one choice, I guess, top school. Um, but it is just bizarre. Um it is really just bizarre. And this guy, uh, Salcedo, had a pretty storied career in UCLA soccer. I mean, he'd won a national championship as a player. He was a successful coach. It also says, man, you are you know, like, what are the economics for him as a professional where he's willing to ditch all of that for 100000 Um, But, you know, this singer guy knew people's prices. You know, he knew where the pressure points were in the system. <clears throat> I, I'm just, it makes me sad. I mean, yeah, uh, in some sort of devious sense, you kind of admire the network that this guy put together, Singer, because he has a whole bunch of coaches on the payroll. <laughs> you know, if you if you dig into this, I don't have the list in front of me, uh, but Jorge Salcedo, the UCLA men's soccer coach, is one of about 30 coaches that are involved in this. You know, and a lot, about half or more of the indictments that were that were made this past week about this or the past two weeks are coaches accepting the bribes. So he, this dude is a, is a glad hander and marketer and business developer like no other. He just kind of put together a network of criminals. You know, if he had gone to work for like, you know, a, a, a Wall Street marketing firm, he could maybe make a ton of money, you know, doing this. Um, again, it, but it makes me sad. It just, it makes me sad. You know, I... I I went to a school, I'm not going to say where it is, but I went to a school with a very, very low admissions rate, you know, and that's hard to get into. And I didn't, my parents didn't do any of this. You know, I just, I took the tests, I had the grades and I got in, you know, that's kind of the end of it. And I, I really think that, I mean, what goes through a mom and dad's head, you know, why, how on earth do you get to the idea that it's, it's a good idea to fake your kid being a collegiate soccer player to get them into into college. Do you not realize that that's going to go badly for you at some point in time? I, I mean, what are these parents thinking? I just can't imagine you're a dad. and I, I mean, I'm, I have a kid, kids. I mean, I just would never do this because at some level it's going to go, it's going to go badly. You know, like these kids who are involved, they're going to get run out of the school probably, at least most of them, and it's ruined their lives. So I just don't know what a parent would possibly be thinking by doing this. Yeah, I don't I don't understand the motivation both from the core motivation like must go to this school like and I don't, you know, so that part is, you know, pretty foreign to me. I mean, obviously you want to achieve stuff, but not like this. And then what you do to the kid, I think is probably more importantly. Like especially in the culture and society we live in, you can find like this stuff is not hard to find right and and we live in a cult a gotcha culture in general like for the, i'm not going to say her name but the the girl the woman young young woman who was the the, the student basically the daughter yeah you know, her bio says on the UCLA women's soccer team website that she was the team captain at the Woodside Soccer Club from 212 to 216. <laughs> the the club d doesn't ever ever have her, have her as a registered player. Like these are not right. These are not difficult things to find out. Like you know, that that that's these are one phone call or one Google click away from busting. Well, and I wonder what athletic departments are thinking. You know, what kind of process – I wasn't a recruited athlete, Chris. I don't think you were a recruited athlete in college. I, I, you know, this just shows that there's zero process involved. You know, I, I mean, I guess if you have a soccer player, 
or a football player, I guess they just turn the names in and the athletic department just automatically says yes without any sort of check and balance. Wouldn't be that hard to have like a verification process you know, at the athletic department level that it does some basic background check to verify that, you know, the information the school's been presented is accurate. <laughs> you know, I mean, you could have one paid employee who whose job it is for five hours a day is to Google these people and make sure that they are who they say they are. You know, wouldn't that be easy to verify? And why isn't somebody doing that already? Because, by the way, this is public funds, okay? And the, USC isn't. But UCLA, it's public funds, and it's, you know, misuse of tax of tax revenue, you know, which is a whole nother level of bad. Um, you know, not that there's not tons of taxes, you know, wasted all the, you know, other places, but I, it just, it says to me, it says something about the quality of the athletic departments that they let this happen. I can see one's skipping through, but this is widespread, you know, widespread. And how does this happen? So, uh, you know, R.I.P. Salcedo's career, which started as a ball boy, um, what, and now he was a head coach. So, you know, I hope I hope you did something smart with that 100000 because that's going to be <laughs> it, that it for you. You'll be teaching uh, youth uh, Saturday afternoon soccer clinic somewhere in Southern California soon enough. And in Southern California, 100000 isn't going to take you very far. No, not not much at all. So next we're going to uh, go to another version of Eye in the Sky, uh, and that is it's NFL offseason, uh, which means uh, they are sifting through the previous season as they plan for the next, and that means the competition committee and rule changes and kind of, you know, looking at what and how the 2019 NFL season will look and be different. And of course, we are still in a hangover phase from the Ram Saints NFC Championship game. And so that is driving a lot of the chatter for the competition committee and the owners, et cetera, et cetera. And probably the biggest, what, innovation, biggest buzz, biggest contribution to the world of professional televised football that the AAF has contributed is their Sky Judge, which, come on, you know, just, just even just all the language around it is good. The NFL, you know, to, to take it on, on that alone. Um, but we've been hearing rumblings that the owners are extremely cold, very resistant and doing their best to put the kibosh on the idea of the sky judge official in the NFL season. Smart? No, it's stupid. Uh, I mean, I'm not, first of all, I'm not one of these people that's that concerned about the length of games. And I also don't think if you shave five minutes off it, it's really going to matter a whole lot in terms of viewership. Um, to me, it's much more important to get things right. You know, and I have zero concern for the egos of the ref because I think part of this is the egos of the refereeing of the of the referees. They don't really want to be questioned. I couldn't care less about that. I think the I really don't. I, you no, know, they're me not. Either. I mean, list of concerns. That's like twenty one hundred. It's not even on twenty one hundred for me. It's not. It's not a concern. I don't care. You know, if you could replace the refs with robots, I would do it in a heartbeat. You know, especially in like baseball, the refs become make themselves part of the show. And you know, guess what? I'd rather watch Mike Trout than have than the ref. You know, so I don't care about the ref's ego. Um, you know, I, I think not enough is being made of the I the fact that the wrong team played in the Super Bowl. Okay, I mean, let that sink in here for a minute. Um, the Saints validly should have been the super NFC's representative in the Super Bowl, but for the multiple mistakes of referees. If you had a sky judge, you know, and the AAF kind of made a thing about it. You know, they have a camera on the sky judge, you know, in and, and the first time I saw it was this woman was, you know, was they had a mic on her and she was debating live on the air. I, I don't necessarily have to have it live on the air, but a sky judge could have looked at that Ram Saints situation gone, wait a minute, this is way foul here, people. Um, that clearly was past interference. You know, this is a mistake. Throw the flag from the sky judge and get it right. Why the NFL would be, owners would be resistant to this, I, it's just, I have no idea. Art Rooney, the, what are we up to? The third, the second, you know, with the Steelers? I think he's, Art I Rooney think he's the second. I think he's the second. Okay, he came out and said that he's not in favor of expanding instant replay this past week. I, I just it blows my mind that 
not 100% of owners aren't on board with every everything on the field is reviewable. Keep the same number of challenges if you want. Let the coach, what is it, two? I think they have two challenges, right? Perhaps, um, yeah. Yeah, let them challenge it on anything. It's not going to lengthen the game. They have two, they can only do it twice, you know? But let them challenge absolutely anything and put this sky judge in place. Between the two of those things, you're going to get most of the calls right. And you want to have a situation where the Rams go to the Super Bowl and they shouldn't have been in the Super Bowl. You know, I'm 100% in favor of this sky judge thing. Well, first of all, if we had had a Super Bowl like Atlanta, New England, or Philadelphia, New England, no one would, fewer people would be talking about this. Um, but to your point, the obvious wrong and worst team went to the Super Bowl with detrimental effects on the Super Bowl. I mean, I don't think you can, yeah. you know, like, so it damaged the marquee game significantly. Um, the Saints would have been a better representative. They would have not cracked under pressure like the Rams. A hundred percent. So we, it had sort of like real implications, you know, the game ended up being great. And, you know, Rams, even if they just, you know, made it a game, the chatter would have been less, but we'd still be talking about it. But I, I, you know, I don't have much to disagree with you here. I think, uh, well, first of all, Art Rooney, Junior should be worrying about why no one with any amount of talent wants to play for <laughs> one of the most storied franchises and fan bases in all of the NFL. But okay, um, but yeah, he, worry about your own team, yeah. not the Sky Judge. <laughs> so, but I agree. I think that first of all, the NFL, no one cares about the length of games. That is such a fake problem that the NFL actually already fixed this past season by eliminating commercials and putting commercials in game so they already they, they actually people want less commercials i don't want to say want less football and they already last that was a great innovation it worked in fact yeah. you're going to skycam you can still split screen like so like i actually think the core their core reason they're resistant has already been solved which just makes it dumber yeah, and quite honestly, the Sky Judge thing in the AAF created some drama. Yeah. Cr- created some programming drama. So now the an- uh, analysts are talking about what the Sky Judge is going to do. And I thought it was brilliant. And you're absolutely right. It's not that people want to see less football, you know, it's that people want to see less commercials. And you're exactly right. You know, the idea of changing the scope of the breaks and putting the split screen thing, that did solve the problem. Um, I-, I just, it's, it's like sometimes these owners. And I'm a conservative guy, you know, generally speaking, as you well know, Chris. Um, but these guys are such stodgy, stick-in-the-mud people. They just have no vision whatsoever, zero. You know, it's it's this isn't the way we've done it, and that's the end of the story. It's kind of a lot of what these owners think. And I, I just don't understand why they wouldn't want to improve the, on, the quality of the on-field product. For, by the way, minimal cost. You're going to put one more Sky Judge and pay him or her you know, a hundred thousand dollars a year to do it. I mean, that's just, that's a drop in the bucket to improve the product immeasurably. Yeah, no, it's certainly, it's certainly not about cost. And what's even dumber to say people want game shorter is to say they want the last five minute of a closed game shorter. In fact, I still think the NFL should be revisiting the fact that, you know, I think when they sped up the game and, and what was, I can't remember exactly, but you know, the, out of bounds doesn't stop the clock until like I think they've already done too much to speed up the end. I, sometimes I feel like the the last ten minutes of any close game goes into like double time rather than actually you know slows down a little bit. So I don't understand any of this. I think the appetite for the drama where this is mostly going to materialize right in the fourth quarter. I mean that's what you know that that's exactly why people are watching. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's it's they're missing an opportunity. Putting in a new sky judge and letting the analysts and the fans debate whether or not there's pass interference while we're waiting on the decision to come down creates drama which holds an audience which results in bigger ratings. You know, it's what doesn't result in bigger ratings is you have more commercials and we have to watch more Bud Light commercials spread out after every kick on every punt return. Like you pointed out, they fixed that problem by and large already. You know, that is, that's the way to shorten the game. So I, I, I agree. They ought to do it. They won't probably because it's the NFL, but they should. And they're, they're so stodgy. I think it, I think we will see a sky judge in five years, I think is a fairly safe bet, but, and the NFL almost has to be like, no way for the first couple years. They almost, it's almost like the song and dance. They have to be, you know, anti it before they adopt it. Yeah. And it's probably because they, it wasn't their innovation. Yeah, <laughs> you know, as part of it, and so you know, it's an ego thing for the NFL. I think definitely. So we'll do it. So the bottom line: do it NFL today, tomorrow, immediately. Sky Judge next year. 
Yeah. Also, it just buys you a lot of goodwill in the end because you look like you're actually trying to solve problems, which is not something the NFL regularly is accused of. Not enough people are talking about the fact that the Saints should have been in the Super Bowl. That uh, To me, that's the story of the offseason, and it just went away. And the NFL doesn't want to have a controversy like that. You know, in, in New Orleans, you know, the city of New Orleans did all sorts of things. You know, they, uh, you know, they ref- the sports bars refused to play the Super Bowl and a bunch of things, but that was con- confined to Louisiana. And the NFL wants to sweep that under the rug. You know, forget it. You didn't see this. Nothing happened. Nothing to see here. You know, proceed on. And they don't want to breathe word one about it. But to me, the story of the offseason is the wrong team played in the Super Bowl because of the mistakes of the referees. Yeah. I hope every one of those referees got fired. hope that whole crew is out of work. Oh, you know they're not. Um, no, they're not. <laughs> All right, so we're going we're gonna, to uh, bounce out of here on, with a, a – used to be more of a reoccurring feature, but we haven't done in a while. Um, and that's quite frankly because there hasn't been a ton of stories. It sort of – it did quiet down. But as the ball family turns popped up again uh, this week in our consciousness uh, – with kind of an interesting one too, and it's not it's not you know not what what silly thing did one of the ball family members do or say, um, but you know did their sort of world of sycophants and uh, shadow capitalism catch up to them, and did they get ripped off? <clears throat> yeah, um, well, have I the only one that has wondered from the beginning how a failed football player with no real wealth started and built? A mark, a, a, a brand from scratch, and got the money together to do this without seemingly without any other real job or money at all. Well, the reason, as we've now found out, is a guy named Alan Foster is involved in the Big Brawler brand. <clears throat> Alan Foster owns 16.3 percent of the company, and what has happened this week is that Lonzo Ball has severed ties with Alan Foster. Alan Foster is the behind-the-scenes guy who's really running the business. Um, LeVar is the face of it. He's probably the creative force behind the shoes and the products and everything. But Alan Foster's guy who's really running everything. And so what has happened here, <coughs> excuse me, Lonzo h- had an accountant. The accountant came to Lonzo and said, there's $1.5 million unaccounted for in big baller brand finances. And I know you didn't steal the money. I know LeVar didn't steal the money. The only guy left who can access money is Alan Foster. <coughs> And so Lonzo put a statement out just um, this weekend, this past weekend. We're recording it this weekend, um, but when you hear it, it'll be a few days old. Um, saying Lonzo said, "I'm severing all business ties with Alan Foster," and it quotes Lavar in here as being saying he's very disappointed in this. And so this is the classic age-old story <clears throat> of sleazy businessman. And this guy, by the way, has fraud and money laundering convictions in his past you know so this is not exactly new to him he's done this before he's a bad guy he's a bad person um but this is the age-old story of sleazy business guys taking advantage of athletes who uh are not sophisticated enough to understand how to prevent these things from happening from the get-go. So it's sad. This is not like LeVar being a jerk. This is a guy taking advantage of LeVar um, in a nefarious way, and I I feel bad for him. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's that old cliche, right? You sleep with your pets, you get the fleas, so to speak. Um, (laughs) But, uh, yeah, that's true. And, and, right, the financing has always been in question. Um... You know, it's it's just the kind of a fall from grace might be the wrong word, but just right, right kind of like where this balloon pops that you would have expected and predicted. Um, and you know, it's. I mean, it, I, I mean, I've always wondered why this, how this company came into being. How did Levar Ball dream all this up, and how did he get this off the ground? And clearly, Alan Foster's a guy kind of doing it. But I interrupted you. I'm sorry. No, I mean, I didn't have anything that insightful to say, other than to say. Yeah, I mean, I totally, this totally makes a lot of sense. And someone, you know, someone who has these 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 talents, even these ideas, even, you know, whether it's the athletic talent, the marketing talent, the, you know, kind of the, the product talent, even with the shoe, you know, you need the correct level of financing if you come from a, a middle class existence, which is essentially what they were. Um, now, the, the lesson for people here is 
um, be smart enough to have an independent in an independent look into your finances. You know, if you're in this situation, um, at least Lonzo was smart enough to have a third party look at it and a guy who was honest enough to say, this is the problem, you, you know, that I see and that you need to deal with it. Instead of having just a bunch of sycophant friends around him, there was a smart, licensed, honest person that figured it out. And so I applaud Lonzo for that. Um, whereas, cause so many athletes don't have that and they find out years later when there's millions and millions of dollars gone and not just what to them is a doable amount, you know, <laughs> yeah. million and a half. Free money is never free. <laughs> yep. Uh, is so, that... look, I mean, there's not a lot more to say about it. I mean, there's, we'll see what happens with, with the big baller brand in the future, but we did want to bring this up because, um, you know, we just can't resist bringing up as the ball turns every chance we can get. And the, the probably the biggest you know danger for the big baller brand is you've got one guy languishing on injured reserve or whatever they call it in the NBA, um, and you got two players that you know in and out of college, in and out of whatever these Lithuanian pro leagues or whatever, uh, you know, seem further away from the NBA maybe than they ever were. So. You know, like of the because you need at least one of those guys to hit for the for the gambit to pay off, and that's starting to slide. That might be his biggest problem. Well, Lonzo, I think, is coming around. Lonzo's biggest problem is he's injury prone. This is the second year in a row he's missed time. Lonzo has been as proven. He improved a lot this year. I think he's proven to at a minimum, very minimum, his floor is solid career pro. You know, the other if he can stay kids, on the court, if yeah. Yeah, if he can stay on the court, right. The other two kids, I blame the dad. LeVar is ruining these kids' lives. You know, what he should have done is let the middle kid, LaMelo, I forget their, I forget who's who's who, but the middle kid is the least talented of the three, but he got the USA UCLA scholarship. Should have just let the kid play. You know, stop interfering. Um, and this is the kid that got in trouble for stealing stuff in China, I remember. Um, but the, the younger kid is like the most talented of all of them, you know, and he has a future and, you know, that kid, you should have let him play in high school, play AAU, let him go the traditional college route. And maybe, uh, he would have made the NBA, but you put him in Lithuania and wherever else he's playing, you're lessening the chances, not increasing the chances. And so this is a case of another case of the dad's much like the, the university admission scandal. This is another case of the dad's enormous ego getting in the way of the kid's Excuse me, the kids, um, well, but you know, the kids, um, the best course for the kid. Yeah, certainly. And he looks like he may even be messing with the, that meal ticket because um, I don't, you know, but we're getting further away from these guys being phenoms enough to be able to drive a, uh, sh- you know, a shoe that's nowhere near the center of that industry either. Right. Yeah, exactly right. So more to come on as the ball family turns. We'll see. All right, so that brings us to the end of the episode. Um, I'm still, yes, I'll get the Twitter account out eventually. (laughs) Um, You can find me at ChrisLarry33, and you can find Steve camping out on the Hogsty Twitter handle. Anything coming up you want to talk about uh, in the Hogsty network at large? No, well, uh, you know, li- please listen to Seasons of Discontent, which is Rick Snyder's uh, show with Matt Cones. And yes, I'm still kind of flabbergasted that a professional like Rick would want to join our little bastard enterprise, but it's a great show, so please listen to it. This week on the Hawks side, we've got Matt Shoot from Fanspeak, uh, who is Mr. Draft. So uh, listen to that one. Uh, I don't not like these trade up to get a quarterback rumors that have sparked uh redskins nation these last few days well you're gonna have to listen to the show the hog style to find out what steve shoop has to say about it (laughs) all right he knows more than me but i still have my concerns all right (laughs) so we will see you in two weeks bye